Professor Dave and Chegg here. Whenever we are discussing a chemical reaction, it will be important to understand how this reaction can be depicted using an energy diagram. Let's review some important aspects of energy diagrams now. For any chemical reaction, we must have one or more reactants and we must have one or more products, where the rearrangement of bonds and atoms is signified by the forward arrow. Additionally, any reaction will have something called a transition state, or the highest energy configuration the reactants must attain in order for the reaction to proceed toward products. This is sort of like the halfway point of the reaction. These concepts are best illustrated altogether on an energy diagram. On these, the vertical axis represents potential energy. Sometimes this will be in the form of enthalpy, but we can also depict Gibbs free energy. On the horizontal axis, we have the reaction coordinate, which is essentially just time. It shows the reaction progressing in the forward direction from left to right. Depicted here is an exergonic reaction. We have reactants on the left, and then energy climbs up all the way to the peak, which is the transition state, and then drops down to the products, which sit lower than reactants, with the distance from reactants to products being the energy released. Again, the transition state is the configuration that must be reached for the reaction to proceed, and this is something that exists for only a moment. It is not something that can be isolated. It is an activated complex, whereby spontaneous movement toward the products is then inevitable. The energy difference from reactants to transition state is called the activation energy. This is the energy that must be supplied to reach the transition state, and therefore for the reaction to occur. A large activation barrier does not alter the thermodynamics of the reaction. Only the kinetics, by making it slower, as a smaller percentage of collisions will result in a reaction. Now let's look at an endergonic reaction. Again, we see reactants, products, the transition state, and the activation energy. The only difference is that now products sit higher than reactants, meaning energy must be absorbed for the reaction to occur. So we can call this delta G. Of course, when dealing with equilibria, we can examine both the forward reaction as well as the reverse reaction, which will use the same energy diagram but viewed from right to left. This will have a different activation energy, which will be greater or less than that of the forward reaction, depending on whether it is exergonic or endergonic. We will be looking at energy diagrams for various reactions as we study organic chemistry, so it is important to have the basics down and all of this terminology understood. Professor Dave for Chegg, see you next time.